Thank you. Good morning. How are we all doing? Great. Yeah? My name's Rob Dudley. I'm at Rob Dudley on Twitter. I'm robdudley.com on the web. I'm also incredibly unoriginal when it comes to picking domain names and Twitter handles. Um, as was mentioned, I'm based in Jersey, which is there, a tiny little island off the south coast of England and much closer to France than it is to Britain. Commonly known for this, a few of these, and more recently, some of these. <laughs> It's actually a fantastic place to be, uh, a good emerging tech scene. I'd encourage you to, to drop in if you're passing. So today's session is about front-end automation, which all comes back to time. Was anybody in uh, the gulp session yesterday? Hands up. Whoa. OK. You've already heard the general opening theme to this talk, which is to do with laziness, to do with saving time, to do with efficiency. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being lazy if it means that you're more efficient, if it means that you're saving time, because it gives you more time to do this, or this, or that, if it takes your fancy. In short, lazy developers are happy developers. Now, for those who are not quite so altruistic about themselves, lazy developers also make more money because you're spending less time doing stuff that you don't want to do, and more time building out your projects and working for your clients. <coughs> so two questions. How often do you start a new project? And how do you start a new project? And I would challenge everyone in this room that they must have started a new project at least once in the last six months. Most of you will probably have done one in the last month. Some of you may even have done uh, a handful in the last couple of weeks. Every single time you spin up a project, you're spending time that you don't necessarily need to doing a load of work that allows you to get on with your work. The start of a project is a fantastic time for me. It's, it's this, the blank canvas, the point of potential, this amazing moment where you have this idea that you want to build, but before you can build it, you have to get yourself set up. You have to get your workspace in place. You have to install a load of libraries. And to be honest with you, a lot of the time that can kind of rob you of the magic. You just want to get cracking. You want to start working on whatever it is you're building, right? So we're going to run through three tools today, um, all three of which you may have heard of, some of which you may be using. Some of you may be using all three of them, in which case I apologize. I apologize. Feel free to doze off in the back. Um, we're going to start with the prerequisites, which are node.js and the node package manager. Is anybody not running node in some way, shape, or form on their developer machine? We have like one guy in the back. Awesome. OK, there's um, a common saying around our company. Um, it's a, a little inappropriate, but I think it, it bears restating, that when you're getting started with a new dev machine, new dev environment, you need to get Node installed because it does pretty much everything. Let's node that stuff up. So node.js.org, uh, and I'm now talking literally to just you because everybody else is running it, um, you can get the installers. Our first tool is Bower. Anybody used Bower? Anybody using Bower? Cool. So you'll already know what I'm about to tell you. It's a front-end package manager. It was built by the team at Twitter, and it runs on Node, along with half of the rest of the Internet's tools. Package managers, for those of you who've not used one, are brilliant. Fundamentally, they allow you to address the issue of getting contained, consistent copies of other stuff. Now, I'm guessing that pretty much everybody here has a smartphone, so technically you've already used a package manager, the App Store or the Play Store or whatever. Technically, it's a package manager. If you run Linux servers, you'll have used one, likely, uh, to install and configure your uh, workstation, NPM is a package manager. There are package managers for all the different libraries. Scala, Ruby has gems, Python has pip. There's a ton of them. What Bower does is brings all of that power to our front-end development workflow. So if you haven't installed it, installation, assuming you've got Node up and running, is as simple as that. <coughs> you install it globally via NPM, and you're done. 
Let's take a quick look at what Bower will actually let you do. The first thing you're going to need to do is find the packages you want to install. And the easiest way to do this is via the Bower search command, which takes, um, to be honest with you, quite a lot of different, uh, different potential arguments, uh, different ways of searching. It's quite a good fuzzy match. And it will normally return an absolute ton of stuff. If you do Bower search jQuery, you'll get the main jQuery project, somewhere near the top of the list. You'll also get a ton of other libraries. You'll get forked versions. You'll get specific versions. So the second line is kind of recommended. You want to pipe it through something like head, strip out some of the later stuff. Or you can just you know, wander through it. If you don't know what the name of the package is likely to be, because it's not something as obvious as jQuery or Bootstrap or whatever, you have the Bower repository online where you can search through. You can see exactly what the packages are, how many times it's been starred, when it was last updated, so how current it is, um, who owns it, etc. So we found our package. Now we need to install it. Again, as simple as Bower install and then the name of the package. Easy, right? If you have multiple packages, you can just chain them. So Bower install jQuery space bootstrap, and it'll put it all down in one hit. The interesting thing about what Bower does under the hood is a common property of most package managers in that they handle your dependencies for you. And this is really, really useful. Because take, for example, Bootstrap, which has a dependency on jQuery normally. Now, if you download the Bootstrap library, uh, it will come with a copy of jQuery, which might be an arbitrary copy. You might have a copy of jQuery already in your project. What Bower will do is realize that Bootstrap needs jQuery, and it will pull down jQuery as a separate package. So exactly the same as if you'd run Bower install jQuery and then Bower install Bootstrap. And had you done that, it won't reinstall it. It will manage your dependencies as you go through. And this means that you end up with much cleaner, more consistent libraries. Bower installs into a folder called Bower Components. I think you can override that. Um, but fundamentally, everything is nice and tidied away into one folder so you don't have to worry about it cluttering up your code. Just installing via the command line, installing individual packages, is actually pretty handy. I mean, I use this daily. You just throw a library in. You need something quickly. It's great. Um, it's not the most graceful approach to front-end package management. And this is where the bower.json file comes into play. Now, the bower.json is basically a configuration file that allows you to specify your dependencies. You create this by running the command bower in it and filling out a short questionnaire about your project name, your version number, a load of other bits and pieces. And this will create an empty JSON config file. Well, empty apart from the information you put in it, so no dependencies. And it looks a little bit like that. So we've got a name on there. Um, we've got some ignore stuff. We've got licensing. Uh, quite important, can you see the private flag? Because bower.json files are also used to create public Bower libraries. So you can create your Bower package, you can package your own library, you'd create a Bower.json, define the dependencies, and you can use it to submit it back to the Bower central repository. If you don't want that to happen, make sure that you've specified it as a private Bower package. And if we zoom in just a little bit, we can see the dependencies are defined there. We're loading in Bootstrap, we're loading in a, a, a specific version, give or take. Um, we're loading in Respond, we're loading on. So you can be loading in whatever you want. And the nice thing is that nowhere there have I specified jQuery. It will be loaded for me as a dependency. And if there are dependencies of underscore or respond, those will also be loaded when I run my Bower install. So having created your Bower JSON, you can then run Bower install with no arguments at all. It will read through the file, load all the libraries, and you're good to go. Once you've got a Bower.json file, you don't necessarily have to edit it to install a new library and save it back. Um, you can very easily issue Bower install package name and then save or save dev, and it will update your JSON file for you yeah. nice and easy. The only prerequisite there is that obviously you have to run Bower in it or created your Bower.json file ahead of time, otherwise it will tell you to stop being stupid um, and you're a bit out of luck. Okay, 
other operations that Bower gives us, update, this is quite handy. You know, how many times have you uh, run into a new version of jQuery or Bootstrap's done a minor version increment and you have to download it, rebuild it, work out which version of everything you put together and it's a, a nightmare. Um, Bower update package name or Bower update on its own will just update everything. And of course you'll rerun your tests at this point to make sure that nothing's broken. Uninstall does exactly what it says on the tin. Home and info give you a bit more information about the package. Home's quite handy, it pops open the home page of the package. So if you want to get straight into the documentation, Bower, home, package name, boom, you're there. Register will send your Bower package up to the central repository and version returns the version information and will allow you to increment it if need be. So, given that when I first put this talk together, Barrel was pretty much it, and of course, this being the web, everything moves at about a million miles an hour. We now have a ton of alternatives. There are other package managers. Some of them are just front-end, some of them are front-end and node. Uh, we've got all sorts, and I'm not going to go into any detail at all on any of these, other than to say they all behave in a fairly similar way, and it doesn't really matter which one you're using, provided you're using one of them. So, how are we doing on the laziness stakes? We're doing all right. You know, we can spin up a new package really quickly. We can get all of our a new project really quickly. We can get all of our packages installed. But there's still a bit of nasty plumbing. We have to update our paths, and, and we might have a few different JavaScript files that we need to load into our index.html, or we need to copy files out of the, the Bower Components folder because that's where it puts them, and we need them somewhere else. There's some room for improvement here. Our next tool, Grunt. Now, Grunt is officially an old man on the web at this point. It is, it, it's been superseded twice over. <laughs> um, and when I say superseded, that's a little unfair. It remains probably the first JavaScript task runner that inspired a host of others, and we'll come on to those later on. Grunt's main strength is it has a ridiculous amount of plugins that other people have written to allow you to do all sorts of stuff with your projects. And of course, it runs on Node. So let's run through some of the Grunt terminology. Um, again, quick straw poll, who's using Grunt? Cool. Plugins, fairly simple, pre-written bits of JavaScript that do something. The package.json file is your node npm configuration file. So this is where you'll determine what packages you want to load, what plugins you want to load, and in fact, Grunt will be in there. We'll show you an example of that in a second. The Grunt file.js is where the magic happens. And this is your task runner task flow, really. You script it out, again, pure JS. Tasks in and of themselves are atomic blocks of work that happen on your project. Now, if all that sounds a little bit vague, it's kind of out of necessity because Grunt is, if nothing else, insanely flexible. It will let you do all sorts of crazy stuff, and out of the box, it does nothing other than allow you to load plugins and start configuring it how you want to fit your project. For those who are wondering if Grunt is still useful in, in the face of all of these other new up-and-comings, this was the screenshot of the plugins directory uh, last time I gave this talk in June. Um, and you can see there we've got just shy 3,000. This is the plugins directory as of yesterday. So 500 new plugins have been generated and uploaded. So to answer the inevitable question, is Grunt dead? No, it's not. The Grunt plugins directory, again, similar to the Bower. Um, package directory, a great place to go and search around. You can see your downloads, link through to your documentation, and read a bit more about it. How do we install Grunt? Well, we use NPM. Installing Grunt is a two-parter for those who haven't done it. You need to install the CLI environment globally, so that's your first command, and then you install Grunt itself, the task runner, into your project. We then need to create some files. We need to create a package.json, and we could have already done this, to be honest with you, ahead of time. And what we can see in here is that we've got a grunt package, which is the one we just installed, and we've got a few plugins. Now, these four 
Uh, the names kind of tell you what they do. There's no major mystery there. Um, so you've got hinting, uglification, which minifies, concatenation, which concatenates, and watch, which watches your file system. And you'll see an example of that in a moment. And then we've got our grunt file.js. Now, the grunt file is quite a big beastie. And the first time that you pick it up, you're probably going to look at it and go, OK, what the hell is this doing? So let's just take a quick wander through some of the anatomy of a grunt file. Let's see what makes it up. Every grunt file will start with this module exports line, which basically initializes the grunt environment. And it pulls in the config from your package.json file. Now, this means that it's actually using the package.json to determine which plugins are available. And you'll often find that um, in the event that you don't have your package.json up to date and what have you, this will be your first stumbling block. We then have, for every single plugin, an optional, but normally you'll have something in there, config block. Now, I've pulled out a couple of the four that we've got installed. So this is the configuration block for the concat task. And what we're doing is we're specifying um, a bunch of stuff, to be honest with you. Um, how we want to separate the files once they're in. And then we've got our distribution level source and destination paths. Now, for anybody who's looking a little bit confused at that, what you can actually do within a grunt config block, and I haven't got an example, there might be one later on, is you can specify different configurations for your different environments. So if you want a build that's only uh, applied for dev versus your full dist, you can separate them out. So that's uh, the concat config block. We've then got the watch config block, which is pretty straightforward, to be honest with you. That's actually taking a, an argument of which files to watch. And it takes it from a previous configuration block. So it's taking all the files that are hinted uh, and linted um, and dropping it in. And then we're defining which grunt tasks we want to run when they change. So in this case, all it's saying is take this bunch of files. If any one of them changes, run this grunt task. So relint them. We're getting towards the bottom of our grunt file now. And we need to load in the NPM tasks and you load them in one line at a time. Um, so every single task there is loaded in. And finally, we register our tasks. And these will basically allow you to specify different <coughs> scenarios under which Grunt will run through your plugins, will run through your code. So in this case, we've got two. We've got a test, and we've got a default task. Test just runs the linting, but it could also go off and run uh, Jasmine or whatever else you need it to do. Uh, default, lints, concats, and uglifies. So it produces your full dist-ready JavaScript. And when we look at running it, having got your config file correct, it's as simple as running grunt. That will run the default task. If you want to run a name task, it's just grunt and then the name. Given the sheer volume of plugins that you've got available for Grunt, one of the biggest problems is actually working out which ones you need um, and which ones are any good. Now, this is where, to be honest with you, a bit of peer review comes in handy, um, running through the GitHub projects, checking the updated, the staleness of the project, see how many people have used it. There are, however, a few rules of thumb. Firstly, only load a plugin that does what you need it to do. It sounds obvious, but you might be getting a grunt file from somewhere else, and it's got a ton of stuff that's absolutely irrelevant. You might be using a different testing library. You might not need to minify because that's handled further uh, upstream in your application. So only pull in plugins that you want. Any plugin that's prefixed grunt-contrib, as all of those previous ones were, are official plugins. Now, those are supported by the grunt development team and can generally be relied upon to be absolutely rock solid, kept bang up to date, and always work. A couple of really common scenarios. If you're using this in a dev environment, you probably want to look at some form of live reload plugin, which will install. Uh, you'll need watch for that, and you'll need live reload itself. And grunt concurrent will allow you to basically run tasks in parallel. By default, out of the box, Grunt runs through and it does all of your tasks one after the other. 
And as you can imagine, if you've got a few tasks and you've got a few files, that can take a while. Grunt Concurrent allows you to actually say, yeah, we can parallelize these, these need to run afterwards, and you can kind of basically turbocharge your Grunt build. And again, typically enough, there are now a ton of alternatives to Grunt. We've got Gulp, session on that yesterday. You've got Brunch, you've got Ant for Java guys. You've got, uh, some people are actually still using make files or have started reusing make files. It doesn't really matter, again, which setup you're using, provided you have a scenario that allows you to quickly and easily scaffold out your build and keep on top of it. There is a session, I believe, later on today on Broccoli, which is not on my list. Um, so yeah, check it out. If you want to see an, another alternative tool, go and have a look. And Broccoli does some really cool stuff. So how are we doing uh, so far? Laziness, um, we're looking pretty good. We've got our packages installed automatically, versioned, updatable. And what we're then doing is using Grunt to take all of the effort out of joining everything together. So we can point Grunt at all of our Bower packages, and we can say, actually, we just want an app.js and an app.css or a global.css. So you only have a single file that you need to worry about. We've also managed to bring in live reload, and we've managed to bring in all sorts of other fun. However, Grunt files are, and I will say this um, hand on heart, a pain in the bum to write. You know, if you're a JavaScript dev, then you're probably going to find it less painful. If JavaScript is a secondary language for you, you're probably going to bang your head against it a couple of times. It can take a while to get it doing what you want it to do. You might end up doing weird things with temp files and trying to join everything together. You might decide that actually it's just too much hassle. It's not worth it. <coughs> and this is where our third tool comes into play, Yeoman. Anybody using Yeoman? So, what does Yeoman do? Well, Yeoman's a scaffolding tool. And this is really the crux of getting your, your new projects turbocharged at the start. It pulls in Bower and Grunt. It can also work with Gulp and other package managers. So I think there's a Browserify Gulp um, generator. And it has, at the moment, over a 1,000 generators available for different types of project, different types of, of setup that you might need. And yes, this also runs on Node. We can install Yeoman fairly simply. Yeoman, in and of itself, is a bit like Grunt. It's not massively useful on its own. But we install the rather nicely named Yo package, and we install it globally. And then we need to install a generator of some form. And in this case, we're installing the basic web app generator, which is what I'm going to use uh, moving forward to uh, show you some of the, the real power that this brings. And once you're done with that, you're ready to use Yeoman to really, really speed up your project starts. So a couple of terms that probably need a little bit of definition if you've not come across them. Generators are Yeoman packages that determine a series of Bower packages and Grunt tasks or Gulp tasks and Browserify, it doesn't really matter. They join it all together in a big recipe, and they also put in a ton of configuration and options that you can then use. Prompts in Yeoman world are the fact that these are not designed to run hands-off. A lot of generators in Yeoman will ask you questions as you go through. They'll give you choices. Do you want SAS or LibSAS? Or less, if you must. Um, do you want this version? Do you need a uh, modernizer? Do you not? The generator list, again, all online, and these are starting to look familiar. It's almost as if they uh, were all designed by the same person. Um, it gives you a full hit list of what's available. I would encourage you to go and check it out. You would be amazed at the things that there are generators for. I mean, we're not just talking pure front-end projects. There's generators for um, WordPress plugins. There's generators for uh, .NET web form configurations. There's generators for all sorts of stuff. The odds are very good that if you have a need to start a specific project, you will find a generator that's already been built. It might not be 100% current, but it gives you a good starting point. 
Now, hopefully this works. The easiest way for you to see Yeoman in action is to actually see it in action. So what you're about to see is the installation of a new web app using the Yeoman web app generator. And some very, very, very bad typing on my part. Okay, so this is a prompt. It's asking me if I want Bootstrap, SAS, Modernizer, and away it goes. Now, at this point, if you're following along and you can see that, it's done the Bower install. It's configured my Bower.json file for me. It's now setting up my package.json for my Grunt components um, and is blasting through installation. A little bit of a pause whilst it goes off and gets it because NPM does seem to enjoy downloading the entire internet. Okay, so now we've got PhantomJS because this generator includes full testing. And it's pulled down a binary. It's sorting out your image optimization. Oh, and we're done. How long was that? Was anybody timing that? Because I make that about 59 seconds. And what we end up with is a ready to rock and roll web app project. And you can see there in the directory, we've got a grunt file. We've got our bower.json, we've got our package.json, we've got all of our bower components tidied away, and we've got a nice little app folder that will contain all of our source code. Just in case you were wondering if that was uh, a one-off, we're now going to go through the same process again, but this time we've got any Angular devs in the room. Cool. This is the Angular generator that will do exactly the same thing, but with an Angular bias. And with a bit of luck, yo, Angular. Do I want to use SAS with Compass? Do I want to load Bootstrap? Do I want to use the SAS version of Bootstrap? Yes, 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 yes. And off it goes. Now, this one takes a little bit longer because it gets stuck in a minute. Um, so I'm just going to skip ahead. But the end result is exactly what you'd expect. A ready-to-rock-and-roll, best-practice Angular project with everything that you need loaded in if it doesn't get stuck, around about 60 seconds. Yeah. So, at this point, we're going to have a quick wander through that Yeoman web app project and show you what it does, show you what it looks like, um, and forgive the slightly clunky transition. Okay, so here we are in our web app folder. <coughs> Give that a bit of a nudge, if you'll excuse me. There we go. And we can see our grunt file, our bower JSON, and our package JSON. So let's start with the package.json. Let's just see what Yeoman has decided needs to be installed. <coughs> a lot. It's pulling in a ton of grunt stuff, including copy, concat, uglify, some stuff that we've seen. Um, running through and picking out some highlights there, we've got image optimization, that's quite cool. HTML minification is really cool. Auto prefixer, which I'll come on to in a second, does something amazingly cool. Uh, we've also got mocker for our testing, we've got SVG minification, uh, we've got concurrent loaded there at the bottom so that we can run all of these super fast, and we've got load grunt tasks, which is uh, an alternate way of loading them in. Oh, and we've got some timing metrics so we can see how quickly it goes. Okay, this is the scary one. In fact, it's so scary, I'm going to look at Bower first. So Bower.json is actually nice and, and straightforward. There's not many packages involved. We've loaded the Bootstrap SAS version, and we've loaded Modernizer. Nice and easy. Now, you're probably going to need more libraries than that. You can add them and just save them straight back to that config file as you go. Okay, the scary one. We can't avoid it any longer. The grunt file is pretty huge. The nice thing is it's fairly well documented for us, but as we wander down, we've got all sorts of stuff going on. And all of this is pre-configured, and all of this would probably take you a while if you decided you wanted to write it and debug it on your own. Now, we've got some features in there. I've just skipped past it, actually. 
We've got um, a live reload. We've got a test uh, against Phantom, so it will actually spin up your code in the in the Phantom browser and run real-time testing against it. Um, we've got a lot of stuff in here. And all of these are still, if you remember back to when we ran through the grunt config, these are your task configuration blocks. So we've got mocker testing, we've got SAS configuration. Do we want to use source maps? Yes, we absolutely do. Where are we loading our SAS from? Well, we're loading it from the Bower Components folder. Um, where are we saving it to, et cetera, et cetera. Auto prefixer does some very, very cool stuff with vendor prefixes. So you can write one little block of SAS or CSS if you're not sassy or lessy, and it will automatically detect if it needs to inject the vendor prefixes to make it work cross-browser. We've then got a whole section of stuff that is to do nothing more than take all of the files that have been built and inject them back into your HTML. Now, this isn't just building static assets. This isn't just CSS and JavaScript. It's actually updating your HTML on the fly. And it goes on, <laughs> and on, and on. We're up to, what, 300 lines? A load of stuff that they've decided you can use if you want it, but comment it out, and on and on and on. Right, come on, we're going to get to the bottom of this so that we can actually see the different tasks that can be run. OK, so we've got the register tasks starting to appear here. Um, by default, you get a serve task, which will allow you to basically run live reload. You've got a server task that is basically serve, but has been deprecated. You've got a test task that will run your test. All of this is, is pretty commonsensical, so I'm not going to go through them all. Build does most of the work, and it runs concurrent disk to make sure that everything runs in parallel. And the default task will basically run all three of those tasks. So. If I run grunt in this folder, and off we go. It's uh, starting to hint, then it's running a full set of mocker tests against a phantom JS instance. And it's injecting all sorts of stuff. It's optimizing images. I don't have any images in this demo, uh, so they're nice and easy to optimize. And you get a nice little breakdown at the end of it telling you just how long it took to do everything. Now, that's quite a big build run. But the nice thing is that what you can see there is that actually what took most of the time was your um, mocker and your image opt-in. Now, you can split the tasks out so that you don't have to run absolutely everything every time you update your code. Now, do I have in this one a grunt watch task? Probably not. Oh, there we go. Now, what grunt watch is doing is it's waiting for me to update a file. in my app folder. OK, I just changed that off screen. I just made a quick modification to index.html, and off it goes. And it, it works out what it needs to rerun based on what's been changed. Let's have a quick look through our app folder, which contains effectively our working copy. So this is like your source directory or what have you. And see what we've got in there. We've got a scripts folder. So we can do our custom scripts in main.js. We've got a styles folder, which contains our SCSS file. We've got images that contain, well, I'm pretty sure you can guess what's in images. And we have our index.html, which is the final kind of piece of the puzzle for us, because what you've actually got here is a load of very specific comments that allow you to inject your grunt optimized, your compiled SAS, and your concatenated JavaScript straight into your index. Um, now, this is using an index.html. This could just as easily be um, a template, your master layout, if you wanted to. You could use it in exactly the same way, because it just uses these HTML comments to find the hooks. And as we wander down, we've got, fair enough, some fairly standard boilerplate stuff. And because this is our 
development file, we've actually got all of our JavaScript broken out into individual lines, which makes a lot more sense because we can see what plugins we're loading, what we aren't. If I then switch to the dist folder, which is the end result, this is where it's going to stick the stuff that's actually been built. And what have we got in there? We've got all sorts. We have a fully minified index.html, which I appreciate is almost impossible to read. But then that's kind of the design, right? Um, super optimized. And a couple of things that are worth pointing out is that we've got modernizer loaded. If I blast down to the very end of it, we have our main.js. And all of the other JavaScript will have been concatenated and minified into that. And we have this really, really fantastic feature which is a unique name for each time the build is run. So it generates this little hash, which is great for cache busting. So you don't need to worry about the fact that am I getting the latest version of app.min.js um, and wearing out your control F5 key. And you can see in there, we've got a vendor.js and a main.js. Oh, well, to be honest with you, you've all seen minified JS. There we go. So, fully minified, all nice and tidy. So, What Yeoman allows us to do is stand on the shoulders of people who have put an inordinate amount of time into building amazing grunt files and working out exactly which libraries you need configured. They are probably not going to be perfect for everybody from the get-go. I would encourage anybody to actually install a couple of these generators and then poke around. Get used to them. You're going to need to tweak them to fit your workflow. You're going to need new libraries installed. You might be needing to inject it into a template. You might need to rework some of the paths. But fundamentally, it's a lot easier to read through and change the content that's already been generated than it is to do it all from scratch. And it's a lot quicker. In the event that you need to, you can, of course, build your own generators. This is a big topic, and I'm not going to be covering it all off. There are a couple of salient points. One is use the generator generator package, which allows you to generate a generator. Yeah. Um, remember that each generator is just Node.js. So it's nothing magical. Keep an eye on your folder name. This really caught me out the first time I built one. They have to start generator hyphen and then whatever else. And have a look at the yeoman.io website. Their authoring section is brilliant. They've got a full breakdown from basic generators going all the way through to really advanced stuff. <coughs> Laziness check. How are we doing? We're all over it. We can now start a new project in under 60 seconds. So from idea to starting actual work, not bootstrapping and boilerplating, less than a minute. And to be honest with you, less than less than a minute if you're working on a slightly faster connection than the one I had in the hotel and you have a slightly faster laptop than mine. We aren't all in the luxurious position of starting a new project though. Some of us unfortunately have legacy projects that don't have these amazing technologies in them. How can we make use of all of this stuff without throwing it all out and starting over which nobody's prepared to do? There's a really, really straightforward set of workflows, and I've used these on a couple of projects in the real world. So the first thing that you want to do is make sure that you get all of your static libraries. So if you're loading jQuery or UI or anything else, get those swapped out for the Bower versions. The minute you do that, you've got a central repository for all of your scripts, and you can keep them all up to date much more simply and much more easily. It's a bit of a pain, but normally it's as simple as installing, configuring Bower, and uh, updating your, your core templates. The next step, once you've done that, is to look at gradually building out your grunt file. So you might want to start with some simple minification and keep the files separate because it's just easier. You might want to start by swapping your style sheet out for a SAS sheet. 
gradually you can add more and more tasks in until you're aiming for this kind of holy endpoint of a single JavaScript file, a single CSS file. If you have a task that you do regularly, consider Yeoman. And this could be something as simple as, for example, you have a plugin architecture in your system that needs to build out a couple of new views, it throws in a style sheet, whatever it happens to be, it brings some assets together. If you're copy pasting code and you're copy pasting that plugin template folder over and over again, look at making Yeoman do it for you. Because what Yeoman can then do is it can talk back to your central Bower repository, it can talk back to your central grunt file and say, actually, this has just come along. You need to be updated to do it. And it means that you can start to throw new features into your applications in 60 seconds or less. And fundamentally, build incrementally. Do not attempt to tear your entire application apart and make it bang up to date with Bower, Grunt, Yeoman generators and what have you, because it will take you too long and we haven't got time for it. What you can do is gradually ease out the old legacy cruft and bring in the nice new and shiny. There's a slide missing from here, and it's one that, to be honest with you, is a little contentious. I'm going to preempt it as a question. Versioning. We all use version control, right? Anybody not using version control? Awesome. Versioning for package managed assets, if you've done node development, you'll know that you do not check your node modules folder into version control. You only version your package.json. There's a little bit of back and forth as to whether or not the same thing applies to Bower. Do you version your built files, your dist folder? Do you version your Bower components? Do you just version the source and the config file so that in theory you need to run it over and over again? Um, the only guidance I would say on this is it's probably not worth versioning the Bower Components folder because you can reinstall it in much the same way that you can the Node folder. I would version your built assets. Disk space is cheap, and at least it means that if push comes to shove, something goes disastrously wrong with your grunt file, you aren't left without a way to build your project or deploy your project should you need to. At this point, we're all done. <laughs>